Hi, I'm Josh, lead designer of Snapship's Tactics with Linvander Studios, and today I'm going to show you how to play the game. I'm holding here a Saber XF-23 fighter. This is your kind of introductory Snapship, and I'm going to run you through some of the main ideas of the game before getting into the specifics of certain actions. This ship model is built out of a whole series of pieces that you're going to be able to customize yourself. As you can see, it's entirely made out of modular Snapships. But the most important idea of the game is that every piece that you use to build your ship has a corresponding card that determines how it works. So ships are made out of two kinds of cards. There's this large square chassis card, which provides your basic stats, such as your hull value and your power uh, cube pool. And then it also has a basic stat line of actions that you're gonna do at the start of each one of those ships turns. At the bottom of the card, it also provides you a recipe for how many squadron points the ship uses up, which is important when you start building with multiple ships in your squadron to balance the game. It also has a recipe for the kinds of parts that we use to make the ship. So Sabre here can equip six cards. It can use a cockpit. So we've brought this XF-25 cockpit here. We've got the jump engine, the wings, and we've got three generic systems here, which we've chosen the maneuvering fins, auto cannon, and missile pod. This is the standard build for this particular Sabre. I'm gonna explain a couple of key ideas about how these work before we get into specific actions. So the most important rule in the game has to do with power flow. That is how your ship uses its supply of action cubes to perform its actions. So every ship comes with a number of these blue power cubes based on its power cost here, shown in the top corner of the chassis card. This is gonna be how many actions that ship can perform uh, at any given time. Now, power cubes are never created or destroyed. You're gonna have this pool of, in this case, seven power cubes for the entire game. And you're gonna spend them each round, moving them to park cards to perform actions, and then venting them to return them back to your chassis card so that you can use those cubes again, and so that you can use the cards again. If you look closely, every card has a combination of costs shown in its actions. Everything that a park card can do is shown in these action boxes. Each box has a list of cubes that it would be the cost to perform that action. So for example, if I want to perform this move action, I would take these power cubes and assign them to this card. If I wanted to do the more expensive action at the bottom, it would require an extra cube and it would require two heat from the supply. So there are these two kinds of cubes, and the way that you manage these cubes determines how efficient your ship is going to be during the course of the battle. But the most important rule is that once you've put cubes on a card to perform that action, such as this move action, you won't be able to use the card again, either action on that card, until those cubes are removed. So of course, if you're doing actions that are building up heat, they're going to cost towards the total number of cubes that you can remove each round and free them up. You're going to spend your cubes however many you want during your turn, but at the start of your turn, you're going to get to clear some of them. So if we look at the chassis card here, there are three steps that we'd have to do at the start of every turn, every time this ship activates, and we do them in order before spending any cubes to do hard actions. So those three steps are reset evasion. So every ship has an evasion stat that's tracked on its little dial here. This shows us its current hull value and its current evasion. So we can set the dial to 15 to match its chassis card, and we can set the evasion to, at the start of each turn to, in this case, two. After we've done that, we then get to clear up to five cubes and any combination of blue or red from part cards to the ship's chassis card. Doing so will let us free up actions, but of course, on the first turn of the game, you haven't done anything yet, and you won't have anything to actually clear. Once you've done those two steps at the start of the ship's turn, you then proceed to the chassis movement. So every ship has some kind of base movement that it performs at the start of its turn before activating any engines or wings for additional movement powers. In this case, Sabre has a rotate one and a move long straight ahead. And every move action in the game is some combination of these two icons. Let me show you how those work. Two kinds of movement. We can do a rotation, and all of these uh, movements are gonna use this movement tool here. You can see that there's two arms. There's a long arm and a short arm. And there's also this bracket, uh, two sort of cutouts between that we use for performing rotations. There are little notches where these lines end that will cleanly notch into the ship's base so that you know you've got it lined up. To do a long move, you just take the long move line and dock it to where the arrow is at the front of the ship, pick it up and place it at the other end of the template and it will notch in in the same direction. The short move is exactly the same, except that you use the other arm of the ruler. So you dock the short arm in, move the ship to the other end. 
Rotations are a little bit different. The two lines on the move tool show you one increment of rotation or a 45 degree turn. So you can dock this move tool anywhere on the ship base and rotate until the next radial line on the base lines up to the move tool. That's one rotation, so a 45 degree turn there. However, rotations are not the same as movement because when you do movement, you have to use the full length of the template. But when you do a rotation, you're actually allowed to rotate anywhere up to that amount. So we have this freeform side of the ruler here with no uh, notches at all, and you can freely make, let's say you only need to rotate 15 degrees or 20 degrees, however it works out to get that precision move you need to line up. That's what this part of the tool is for. There's one other kind of movement in the game which appears on some cards. We have this U-turn icon, which is an all or nothing 180 degree turn. So whereas smaller rotations are entirely optional, you don't even necessarily have to rotate, you can rotate up to that amount, including nothing. A U-turn is all or nothing, so you have to do the full 180, or you could ignore it, it's your choice. Now that I've shown you how movement works, let me show you how attacks work. Because once you've done those moves, you're gonna do them to get in range of your opponent. So every weapon in the game has the same set of icons. There's a firing arc, a range, a dice pool, with a number to hit and a damage per success. So when you measure range and firing arc, you need to meet both of those criteria to be able to make the attack to pay for this action and perform it. All of the measurement for range and firing arc uses the radial lines and the distance between two ship bases. So if this is my target for the attack, and my weapon in this case is a Mark 16 autocannon with the forward 90 degree arc, I have to measure range between the two bases, the shortest point between them. In this case, we are not range one, but range two, which is well within the range of my weapon, and within the 90 degree firing arc lines on my base. I've met the criteria to attack, I can make the attack. This weapon rolls its pool of four attack dice, and hits on two plus my target's evasion. In this case, I'm gonna shoot at this Scarab model here, which has an evasion of three. So I'm gonna hit on fives. That's a pretty good roll. I got three total hits because five, six, and six are hits, four is a miss. However, you'll notice there are two special faces on the dice. There's a blank, this is always a miss, and there's a critical hit, this is always a hit. In addition, the critical hit also allows me, as the attacker, to look at my opponent's console, choose one of their cards, and flip it to the disabled side. Now, if they had been using that card, there were cubes on it, for example, let's say they did this bottom action here, which costs two power and two heat, and I disable this card, I return all of those cubes to their appropriate supplies, so they get the power cubes back, and the heat cubes go to the game supply. But each heat cube I remove from that card does my opponent an additional damage. So in this way, heat is a liability not just because it makes your parts more difficult to fully vent and activate again, but it also can cause you additional damage if you suffer critical hits. The last thing I want to show you is the terrain. So terrain has effects on both moving and shooting. And you generally want to use terrain by overlapping it to claim its benefit. Whenever your ship performs a move and its base overlaps a terrain tile, you immediately receive the bonus associated with that kind of terrain. This ice cloud here, for example, allows you to immediately vent one cube of either blue or red from your parts to your ship's chassis, freeing up your actions to use again. The debris field here, if I overlap it, is going to immediately increase the evade on my ship's tracker dial by one, providing me additional defense against incoming attacks. Those bonuses only apply when you enter the tile. As soon as you leave that tile, you've still got that bonus, but you're eligible to enter it again. If, for example, I overlap the tile and then move so that I'm still overlapping the tile, I don't get the bonus a second time. I have to fully leave and return to claim it. Terrain tiles also have effects on line of sight for shooting and provide cover to the defender, potentially. So whenever you measure the range for an attack, you're measuring the shortest point between the two ships. If that line of fire crosses the terrain tile, whatever you needed to roll to hit is increased by two. So in the example we gave earlier with the autocannon, where it was two plus the ship's evasion of three is five, I would now need sevens because cover increases the shot by two. However, as the attacker, if I'm overlapping a terrain tile, I can shoot out of it with no penalty at all. So in this case, I shoot out of fives, but the scarab shooting back at me is going to, I'm gonna get cover against that attack. It's going to have plus two on its roll. You now know everything you need to know to start playing with one cool twist. Ships do not begin the game on the map, 
On your first turn, you're going to deploy them anywhere against your edge of the play mat before taking the first turn, giving you a chance to set up and changing the flow of battle on the first turn. Thanks for checking out our How to Play video and for checking out our Kickstarter for Snapship's Tactics. You can see more information about this game. We have a full-on playthrough video of a 1v1. We also have a two versus two cooperative scenario. And you can also check out our streaming schedule where we're gonna be playing the game repeatedly throughout the campaign and answering your questions.